Folks, I'm going to be your after lunch entertainer. I'm a storyteller where I'm from, and that's from Clear Lake, Iowa. I got up kind of early to be over here today, which is no problem. But I walked out to my truck. The sun hadn't come up. Before I got the door open, I found myself laying on my back, a little icy. My hand was bleeding. My elbow was bleeding. My wife was still in bed, and I didn't want to wake her up, so I had to fix myself. Got in the truck, drove down here. It's always a good day when you come up to Minnesota. I'm actually from an hour north of Green Bay, Wisconsin, so if you know where Green Bay is, um, I like coming up here because it reminds me of home. So here's my little story, and I tell people that I'm going to be 67 years old in around Thanksgiving time this year. And the last eight or nine years of my life have been literally an agricultural version of a fairy tale. And I've thought long and hard, do I actually tell people that I've been living a fairy tale, but I don't know any other way to describe it. And I want to tell you about my fairy tale, and then I want, you to, I want to explain to you what this is and what it is doing. And remember, um, I've been doing this for 42 years, so I've become a pretty good salesman in 42 years, but don't trust me. But listen to the story. <clears throat> I run a consulting company, and I manage a little bit less than 60,000 acres. I'm a one-man show. I don't scout weeds. I don't scout bugs. I get paid for one thing and one thing only is try to help my businessman, I mean farmer, create more yield on his land. And I have to be very open-minded when I do this because you just never know what's going to work. And for a lot of years, I literally told people, um, your secret to creating more production and profit on your ground is to use more fertilizer. I was always more fertilizer, more fertilizer, more fertilizer, because it made life easy on me. Today, I don't do that. So nine years ago, I went to some consulting clients, and I said, last weekend, I was at a backyard barbecue in Clear Lake. That's where I live, right down Interstate 35. And I was introduced to a farmer from Indiana. And the lady who introduced me said, this is Mr. Wagner. He's a consultant. He works with growers. And the farmer came up to me and changed my life forever. He asked me if I had been familiar or had ever used biodyne microbes. I had to figure out what a microbe was. I knew what a microbe was. No, I had not used biodyne microbes. Well, he proceeded to tell me a story. And when I left that <clears throat> barbecue that afternoon, I told myself this story was too good for me to walk away from. <clears throat> there was something that businessman said to me. And I trusted him. I never knew him before I saw him in this backyard barbecue. But I knew <clears throat> that this guy believed very passionately in what he said. So I went home. I looked up this darn biodyne company on the computer. I went to some of my clients, and nine years ago, I put the first 2,500 acres of biodyne microbes in Iowa farm ground. The first 2,500 acres. Last year, when you harvested, we went from, it was nine, nine crops later, but we had went from 2,500 acres to over 2 million. The company that I represent hired me, and I said, well, I'd love to be the person who distributes your technology west of the Mississippi River, but I'm not giving up Wagner Consulting. And they said, that's okay, you can do both. The problem with this company today is it's a small company and we are growing literally by $25 million per year. So the only thing that I worry about when I drink my coffee in the morning is, am I going to get what Nate needs to Nate when he needs it? $25 million a year. I've got this saying, it's called, it's all about the money. Because when I deal with business people, it's all about the money. It is really all about the money. And I don't try to insult anybody with those comments, but it's all about the money. And this is why I'm telling you this. So this is a story that went from 2,000 acres to 2 million in nine crops and is now a business. It's snake oil. Nine years ago, my personal friends couldn't believe that somebody that had the credibility and reputation that I had in this industry would even be doing this. But I don't believe anybody. I only believe myself. So the reason why you have a photocopy presentation, no slides, no literature, is because I only believe in myself. So I'm going to share my story with you. And my story happens to represent the story that you heard this morning. 
um, your future, your son's future. Because I, I look around here and I see younger people. Thank God. You know, in Iowa, the average, I think Iowa State indicated a month or so ago that the average farm in Iowa was worth 11000 bucks an acre. When I got in this business, the high rollers were buying ground that was 3000 and they were going bankrupt left and right. 11000 bucks an acre and a farm in northwest Iowa sold last summer for, I believe, 22000 How does a guy get into this business? It's all about the money. Okay? Here's my other little, little pet peeve. I don't like the price of fertilizer. And I'm in business for myself, and when there's no competition, we seem to pay higher prices. I think it was just four crops ago where anhydrous ammonia down by me in Clear Lake was $550 a ton, and I'll bet you the Koch brothers were making good money. Last spring, it was $1,500 a ton. And when you look at the people, and it's not the co-op, it's not the independent fertilizer dealer, it's these giants. When you look at the profitability of the giants, prior to the pandemic, and look at the profitability of the giants in the last three years, they're making five to nine times more money per year than they used to. And we all know, the price of your grain goes up, the price of your fertilizer goes up. The price of your grain goes down, the price of your fertilizer goes down. Okay? I just never had a means of instructing people who are businessmen on how you deal what, are, what is really your option if you don't like the fact that people are gouging you? And that's what's going on. They're gouging you. And I apologize for that because I respect. And I know you need fertilizer, but they're gouging you. And the government allows it. That's the other thing that aggravates the hell out of me. So I'm going to tell you a story of one of my farm clients. His name is Guy Fishman. And Mr. Fishman... My largest client is almost 40,000 acres. My, my smallest client is 1,025 acres. Guy Fishman is my 1,025 acre customer. And I tell people if I ever had to leave my wife with another, another man for a year and go away, I would leave my wife with Guy Fishman. He's one of the nicest people that I know. He's one of God's best people. When you drive onto Mr. Fishman's property, he's got a white house and two small white buildings, and all three of them need a paint job. He loads me up into his pickup truck, and I know it's at least 18 years older than mine. It's a nice pickup, it's no rust, it's clean, smells good, gets us where we want to go, but it's 18 or 19 years old. Mr. Fishman used to buy from the local co-op a whole bunch of nitrogen, a whole bunch of phosphorus, and a whole bunch of potassium. A couple of his soil tests are sitting right in front of you, and that's the, the one that you see that has <clears throat> got all the numbers on it. But I want to explain to you what these sheets mean and what he found in the last three years. The other handout has a picture of a fence line. And I probably asked 2,000 farmers this question in the last six years or eight years, whatever it is, have you ever taken out a fence line <clears throat> and added it to the field that you've been farming for 30 years? Of course you have, okay? I'm going to tell you it's the only question I've ever asked in my entire life where the answer from farmers like yourself is always the same. So then I say, let's say we took out this fence line. Last fall, we added it to the 60-acre field right next to it that we've been farming and fertilizing and doing all of our good stuff on for 30 years. So next spring, that field's going to be corn. It's got the fence line now removed. We're going to plant one corn hybrid in it, fertilize everything the same. <clears throat> when that corn comes up and gets a foot tall, what does the corn look like that used to be the fence line versus the rest of the field you've been farming for 30 years? Anybody want to walk at the end of the diving board and answer that question? Or I'll do it for you. What's the answer to that question, sir? Thank you. So the corn's always bigger, it's always greener. I've had farmers tell me it'll yield more for up to seven years. Is the co-op fertilizing it for you? So I asked, and why is the fence line? Do you realize how little money you've spent on the fence line and it is outperforming the farm field next to your fence line that you have spent a fortune on? The average fertilizer bill in Iowa this year is $325 an acre. 
So part of the moral of this story is if you decide to buy any of our stuff, you take every dollar of what you are going to buy from us that Nate used and subtract it from your fertilizer bill. It's called cost substitution. So if this story actually works on your farm, it does not increase the amount of money that you are spending to farm that field. So then I ask, I ask people, okay, what is the magic of the fence line? Why does the fence line, why is it so productive? One of my clients owned a farm field. There was a fence line. There was a neighbor that owned the farm field on the other side of the fence line. About five years ago, that field became for sale. So my client on the other side of the fence line bought the field of his neighbors, removed the fence line and made it one big, one big field. And the first time I told him this story, he got out his iPad and he said, I want to show you the yield map of that field where I removed the fence line. And he said, Bob, I can't remember if it was five or six years ago. You could still see the red line right down the middle of the field. Remember this point that I made a few minutes ago? I said, it's all about the money. It's all about the money. Now, here's, the, here's where the story gets good. The reason why the fence line outperforms the field that you and your son or dad or whoever it might be, I've got clients that I'm now three generations with, grandpa, dad, and son. And what I tell people, what I tell the young people is your future is soil health. And if you, for, the better you make your soil, the less fertilizer you're going to have to buy, and, and, and your yields will go up with less fertilizer. I was telling a gentleman, a couple of, couple of groups of farmers this last week, and again, this is Iowa, so I don't say this is Minnesota, but if you have not made $400 an acre in the last th three, if one of the last three years, that means you've either didn't yield enough or you spent too much money on input. $325 an acre on fertilizer is a lot of money. Okay, so what I've learned, my wife owns a coffee, ice cream, Iowa wine store in Clear Lake, and it's all about how much money was in that cash register when she started the day and how much money was in that cash register at the end of the day, period. And we learned very quickly that we had to control expenses. So the reason why the fence line is so magic Matter of fact, <clears throat> when the ground, th when the ground th thaws out in the spring, take an iron rod, if you happen to have an extra one, and stick that iron rod in your fence line and then walk out into the field that you've been farming for a profit for 20 years and stick that iron rod in the ground and you'll be shocked how different it is. That fence line has a higher level of soil health. As a matter of fact, if you soil test the fence line, the definition of soil health is microbe count. So the more microbes you've got in your soil, the soil testing lab will tell you the healthier your soil is. And what we learned this morning is it's not just microbes, it's also the carbon that they need to do their job, which is a real special form of carbon called WEOC. So you know what I do? I actually monitor WEOC on my clients' farms. And I tell them the higher the damn soluble carbon number is, the higher your beans are going to yield, the higher your corn is going to yield, the higher your test weight is going to be in your corn and the lower the amount of fertilizer you're going to be able to do to make it all, all work. Some people always stop me when I'm saying this and call me Preacher Bob, which I'm flattered when people do that, because that's what I love to do. You don't find many people 67 years old still in this business, and it's awful quiet in here. Wow. Okay, here's where this story gets better. So the reason why the fence line will outperform the field next to it is because of soil health. Now, what are the two primary components of soil health? The microbe level in that fence line, if you actually soil test it and then soil test out in your farm field, the microbe level will be 30 to 35 percent higher. So microbes, or what is doing it in your soil, and that was the purpose of the morning, is 30 to 35 percent higher in that fence line. The other thing that you'll find is the soluble carbon which Jason and Christina and Nate and whoever else addresses called WEOC. That's the soluble carbon. The WEOC will be 100 points higher in your fence line than in the field that you are trying to make money on. So the microbes are there, the carbon is there to feed them. And when you remove it and put a plant in there, despite the fact that it has hardly any of the fertilizer that you put on your ground, it teaches us something.
And I have never had a farmer in eight years tell me that the fence line wasn't as good as the rest of his field. Never. This little handout that's got the fence line, turn it to the last page. I want to show you the power of this. And so if this is a picture from you go south down the interstate, you go over the Minnesota-Iowa border. If you go to the west 15 miles, you'll run into a town called Lake Mills. And I remember telling this story to a farmer who was using a whole bunch of starter fertilizers. As a matter of fact, he was putting on four gallons of 624-6 with his planter. We got heavy, cool soils down there most years. I think we're going to go back to having heavy, cool soils. Been kind of dry down there the last couple of years. <clears throat> so I tell this farmer that it's the microbes. You've got a river of phosphorus. It's called four gallons of 624 six starter underneath every corn plant in your field. What I'm going to do with this pint of microbes that I'm going to add to your starter fertilizer for roughly $9, I'm going to then take your four gallons of 624 six starter and I'm going to make sure that more of it gets into your plant. And the microbes are going to do it. The guy apparently trusted me. Then, a, then when he was growing his corn, he pulls into this field. He takes a picture through the windshield of his tractor and sends it to his fertilizer dealer who sends it to me. You see the strips in there? Some strips are green, st some strips aren't. You can clearly see the strips. There's four gallons of 624 six starter under every row of corn that you can see in this picture. But how he did this is he alternated putting the microbes in with the 624 six starter. So this is four gallons of 624 six starter with and without one pint of microbes. By the way, when you take a two and a half gallon jug of our microbes and pour it into a whiskey shot glass, there's probably one over there. There is more microbes in that shot glass than there are people on the planet Earth. So you got to feed them. And that's the purpose of this carbon. So when I actually track the yield of my clients' fields, I want to know the yield in one number of that field, either corn or beans. I want to know the WEOC number, and I want to know the test weight if it's corn. Okay? When you harvested a cornfield last fall, <clears throat> and the combine was done, it was a 38-acre field, the combine's done, you're on the road, you're now going on to the next field. If you look back at that field, you'll see a carpet of residue laying there. A carpet of residue. If that farm happened to yield 200 bushel, and I'll just use 200 bushel because there's three university studies that Minnesota, Nebraska, University of Illinois, I think Penn State did one. That residue that is laying on your ground that you can visibly see, because it takes a lot of fertilizer to grow an eight-foot-tall plant, 30,000 or 32,000 of those per acre. <clears throat> so the residue that is laying on the ground after you harvested that corn last fall contains 40 pounds of N, 50 pounds of P, and on a bad day, 110 pounds of potassium. And I've seen that number up to 150. On your way home today, go into your fertilizer guy and say, what would it cost me for a 40, 50, 110? It's a lot of money. The nitrogen alone is 40 bucks. Okay? So the other thing that we do with our microbes is we degrade that residue because that residue is absolutely loaded with previously invoiced fertilizer. Did anybody ever tell you that we got to start utilizing what we paid for last year and what we paid for the year before. And if you're a continuous corn farmer, dig in the ground, you'll see residue from three crops ago. So it breaks down by microbes. So part of the gig here is we got to break down that residue because it, it leaves you previously purchased and paid for N, P, and K. And guess what else? It's an absolute gold mine of this wonderful carbon. This wonderful carbon. It's all carbon fiber. It's called lignin and cellulose. It's carbon fiber. And eventually I tell people when I have my retirement party, I'm going to stand up in front of anybody who cares to come and honor me. Hopefully there'll be a few. And I'm going to say the most, in my 40 years, four decades, the greatest missed business opportunity of farmers that I deal with is called soil health 
and it's very closely followed it by residue management. So I want the fertilizer back out of that residue. Look at the uh, second picture after the, or the third, the second picture after the residue, after the front page, which is the fence line, and you'll see some corn plants and some pieces of residue on the tailgate of somebody's truck. So this is microbes applied to the soil with the soil applied herbicide in the spring. So these microbes, you can put in furrow with your starter or with water. And if you want to broadcast them, if you don't have starter, then whatever herbicide you're using to provide a soil effect, your residual herbicide, you just mix it with that and spray it on the ground. That's it. That's what was done here. So we broadcasted residue degrading microbes with our soil applied herbicide in this cornfield. And then we went out when the corn was about two feet tall. And the reason why we went out when it was two feet tall, and Jason alluded to this, when your corn is roughly this stage, it is telling itself rows and kernels per row. So we want the corn to be comfortable. We want the corn to be relaxed. We want the corn to be well fed. See, the other thing that I, I struggle with in this business, and the guys with gray hair are probably going to jump up out of their chair and start clapping. Folks, I'm going to tell you, we don't grow a big enough root system under our plant. Do you realize in a, in a University of Minnesota textbook that the below ground root system is supposed to be as big as the above ground plant? That root system is the means by which you get water. That root system is the means by which whatever you spend on fertilizer gets into that plant. It don't get in there hardly any other way. It's through the roots. So one of the things I focus on, I want a massive root. So the things that I do, I want to be able to dig the corn up, and this is why I do it, and see what the root system looks like. The plants, the three, the three corn plants on the right, it's the same corn hybrid, same fertilizer program, same field. Look at the difference in the residue. That residue is degrading, and it's a scientific process called fermentation. It's no different than what this winery used to create a glass of wine. It's called fermentation. Fermentation is a microbe, it's oxygen, and it's water. So what I am doing here is I'm degrading the residue because I want the previously purchased fertilizer back into that field as fast as I can get it there. Look at how uniform the three plants are on the right versus the three plants on the left. Here's another one of the things that I focus on. I want roots. I want to use less fertilizer and I want most all of the plants in that field, a 40 acre field, 30,000 plants per acre and I want in a 24-hour period, 80% of the corn plants that that farmer poured into that plant or drove across his field, I want those to start to come out of the ground. 80% of them in 24 hours. And guess what? If you look back at the picture that we looked at after the fence line where there were six rows of 20, the 24, six 24-6 starter versus the starter with the microbes, what would really amaze you isn't the color, isn't the vigor, but how many of these plants are absolutely identical twins of each other. It's called cold germination. Because you go out in that field, when that ear is on that plant, there's tassels up there and you can see what ear that you are going to harvest. If you stand in front of one plant and then you look at the plant just very close next to it, and it's six inches shorter, or even four inches shorter, you're going to have an ear that's it's unbelievably different. The ear of the tall plant is going to be eight inches long, and if that corn plant just right next to it is four inches shorter, that ear is going to be six inches long. I call this stand optimization. You want your corn to be uniform in size and in emergence so that they compete. They don't outcompete each other for sunlight. Okay. So I got this, this buddy, Guy Fishman. Him and I become pretty good friends. And in 2020, we took his highway farm. And Nate can do this. By the way, Nate. I met Nate for the first time last summer. Because Nate called up and he said, I've heard a bunch about the microbes you sell, and I hear you're the guy. I'm interested in getting some. Where can I get them? So as a, as a good salesman, I got him some microbes. But I'm one of these strange salesmen. 
And then I warned Nate when he bought some of this stuff that I'm going to come back and I'm going to look at your crop. So if you buy some of this stuff and you don't mind hanging out with me for a half a day, call me because I want to see your, these microbes on your farm. That's how I learn. So I went back to Nate's place. He bought something from me. I went back to the farm to look at what he bought from me. And Nate then tells me that he's in the NCGA. And Nate's a pretty good farmer. But I, it, you know, I don't, this was a, the second time I'd met Nate, so I hadn't spent more than two hours with Nate in my entire life. He takes me out and he shows me where he's got microbes with his starter fertilizer. And we walk into his field and he says, I got microbes with my starter here and I got no microbes over here. And we walk in and out of this corn and, gee, Nate, did you see any difference in this? The corn was more uniform. The leaves were very wide. They were green. These plants are very healthy. By the way, I also have a really strange philosophy about what my corn needs to look like when I combine it. And I tell people that if anything is killing your corn but frost in your combine, you're accepting less test weight. Test weight comes at the end of the season. We sell by weight of our kernels. We want heavy corn. So to have heavy corn, that corn plant has to be alive, and there's no moisture penalty. So two, two crops ago, I was on Twitter. Almost the first week of November, he had just a little bit of his 500 acres of corn left, and I said, well, before you harvest the end of it, I want to come over there. When I left that morning from Clear Lake to drive over to his farm in western Iowa, I put my little handheld, they look like a big pair of scissors, my tree trimmers. That's what I lop branches off my oak trees with. And I was on Twitter, cutting into this man's stalks so you could see water running out of the stalks of his corn in the last days of his harvest. No moisture penalty on, on the grain. And that water is what? Sugar, which is what? Carbon. So the thing you, that you will experience if you elect to follow this story of a guy you can't trust because you don't know me, and you can't, is the fact that when you harvest your corn, you're going to be shocked. There's going to be green in it. Unless it's frosted, there will be green leaves. Your stalk will be this beautiful lime green color, lime green. And it'll be healthy. And remember what Jason said, that darn stalk is my straw. We can't have a, we can't have a diseased straw. So the other thing that microbes do and carbon does and the healthier soil does, it creates a healthier plant that grows in it. Here's the Guy Fishman story, and this is where this ends. So in 2020, Mr. Fishman used our microbes. And we went out there, thanks to Jason's lab, because Jason's lab has the unique ability to be able to tell me where my soil health is. Okay, so I developed my own concept relative that's called benchmarking. I want to know where the hell that carbon is. I want to know when you start your activities with microbes where your carbon level is. So in 2020 on Guy Fishman's fa uh, farm, this soil test was taken July 17th. And if you look at the left-hand column, I've circled what the WEAC is. That's what we, I heard WEAC probably a dozen times this morning. This is the carbon that fuels the microbes in your soil. This is their food. This is their energy. They do not operate without carbon. Remember I told you that we're restoring his farm field so that when you use our microbes, you are restoring your farm field, the, your business. I called it a farm field. It's a business. You're restoring the microbe level or the soil health level to replicate that of the fence line, and we can measure it. We can show you that it happens. Did you ever see a 67-year-old guy this happy? Very seldom. Very seldom. And I haven't even had a beer, <coughs> but I've had coffee. So anyway, his WEAC is 174. That's the highest WEAC I've ever seen at the beginning of microbe applications. Usually that soluble carbon number, which is WEAC, is less than 100. Your farm field will be, the fence line will be 230 to 250. If you turn the page and look at what the WEAC turned out to in 2022, 
We went out back out to the, to the highway farm, June 17th, and we tested his soil again. What was the WEOC? So in 2020, it was 174. In 2022, it was 238. 238, and when you test for WEOC in your fence line, which I know outperforms the rest of your field, your WEOC will be 230 to 250. Here's the good thing. What happened to his nutrients? Now, this is what I got to tell you about the Fishman Farm. It's called the Highway Farm. There is no hog manure history on this ground. There is no chicken litter history. There is no turkey litter history. There is no cow manure on this farm. None. Never has been. And when the first time I actually looked at his soil test that the co-op did, the nutrient levels, he puts on very average amounts of fertilizer. And his nutrient levels were very average, exactly what I would have expected to see. Look at now the nutrient solubilization. Because so, the other thing that these microbes do, and Christina and Jason alluded to this, it's not how much fertilizer you put in the ground. It is how much fertilizer that you put in the ground is solubilized so that it can get into the plant. And that's why the starter fertilizer picture was stripped, is that's because where the starter fertilizer was combined with microbes, more of that river of starter that was underneath that row of corn was actually available to the plants. And when you do that, you can then reduce the amount of fertilizer you put there because I'm more efficiently using what I do use. So there's no manure history on this ground. Manure is gold. There's no manure history on this ground. Mr. Fishman fertilizes with 160 pounds of N. And in Iowa, the average guy is probably using somewhere between 200 and 220. Mr. Fishman is 160. He stopped using MAP or DAP. So when he started using microbes, he stopped buying phosphorus. There is no MAP or DAP on this ground in 2021. There was no MAP or DAP put on this ground in 2022. He does not have inferral, so he can't put starter on. In 2023, when he plants his corn this next spring, there will be no purchased phosphorus on this ground. None. 160 pounds of N, no phosphorus, and he puts on about 100 pounds of potassium, which is half, half of what his neighbors are using. When Mr. Fishman started to harvest this field, this last fall, he called me up and said, you know, my field view says I'm 14 inches of rain, less my 10-year average. Take 14 inches of rain out of the equation. It's pretty dramatic. When he finished harvest, he was about 13.2 or 3 inches of rain, less his 10-year average. In this case, he bought all pioneer corn. So he called me up on the phone and he said, what are fields in my area yielding? I kind of like the shell game. And I said, Guy, to be honest with you, the person who really knows what farms are doing in your area is the seed dealer you've been buying your seed from that's been a seed dealer and a personal friend of yours since high school. He's 55. I want you to ask him. He said, Bob, I knew you were going to tell me that's so I already did. Ugh. I said, what'd you get, Guy? He said, my corn was 20 bushels less than it was the year before. Who would ever admit that? I said, well, what was the number? He said 201. He did 201 on 525 acres of corn with almost 14 inches of rain, less than what he normally gets. In my lifetime, that doesn't compute. So I said, okay, what'd the Pioneer dealer tell you? And Mr. Fishman told me that he was a very fortunate individual because your neighbors are getting 160 to 180, and he's the seed dealer. He had the same experience in 2021. He had the same experience in 2020. So look at the nutrient solubilization. And this is the wonderful thing about Jason's lab, is he's able to help us with this, and accurately. So in 2020, if you look at the front page of this sheet, the middle column, see at the top of it, I've circled it, it says phosphorus, it says PH3A, that's the total amount of available phosphorus. <coughs> In 2020, he had 18.6 parts per million in that ground, 18.6. 
He didn't use any, didn't put any purchased invoice phosphorus on that farm and because of microbe solubilization of fertilizer and the degradation <laughs> of residue, meaning he is getting previously purchased phosphorus back out of his corn, his phosphorus level went from 18.6 in 2020 to 34.8. No phosphorus applications went on this ground. And his phosphorus almost doubled. Right below it is potassium, it's K. In 2020, his K, which I circled, K H3A, which is the total available potassium to that crop, was 78.4 parts per million. In 2020, it was 440. So do you see why you can take what you spend on biology, what you invest in microbes and what you invest in carbon and directly take them out of your fertilizer purchase? So the amount of money that you are spending on that acre does not change. And that's how you make money. So if you can keep your expenses on that acre flat, I'm not an economist, but if you can keep your investment in raising that crop flat and at the same time increase your yield, I'll bet you you and the kid are going to be happy. And when my guys are the happiest is when we actually create tax problems together, oddly enough. The calcium. We talked about how important calcium is. And I think we tissue test and soil test as a company about 600 farm fields a year. In Iowa, there was 300 of them alone. And 85% of the time, I believe is the number, calcium was the limiting factor on Iowa farms. 85% of those 300 farms. It's really important. His calcium in 2020 was 382. His calcium in 2022 was 959. Look at the sulfur number on the right side of that page. In 2020 on the highway farm, his sulfur number, it's circled there on the right side of the page, was 9.8 pounds per acre. I recommend 25 to 40 pounds of sulfur per acre. In 2022, his sulfur went from 9.8 to 19.9 pounds. This is all a result of what I'm going to call soil health. And I'm going to finish with this story, because I like stories. I've learned to understand things with stories. And that's how I explain things to people. I use stories. So a long way south of here, I'm known as a storyteller, and I'm proud of that reputation. If that's my reputation, so be it. I remember getting a call one day from a, a farmer in western Iowa. His name was Mike Hopkins. Mike used to really aggravate me. Because if he goes out on a thousand acres and finds one weed, he sends me a picture on my cell phone of this one weed. So I always send my text message back. I say, Mike, you got a lot of this weed or is it just one out of a thousand acres? His wife, Lori, when I first started working with him, his wife, Lori, said, Bob, you got to watch my husband. He's real particular. And Lori says to me that he'll get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. He doesn't sleep very well. He'll get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. He'll grab a flashlight and go out and start looking at his crops. Mr. Hopkins, who's now one of my best friends in this world, called me up and said, Bob, I've got something to show you next time you're in the area. I live about two hours to the east of him. Next time you're in the area, stop by. I want to show you something. Well, when Mike wants to show you something, you don't wait a day or two, you get right over there. So I said, the next day I'm going to be there at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock in the morning, I'll be on your farm, Mike. So when I get to the farm, we jump in, in his Polaris, whatever it is. He's got two dogs. Mike's about six foot five and weighs probably in the 325 range, so I'm half his size easily. Mike drives. Dolly, the one dog, gets in the seat on the Polaris Ranger right next to me and the other dog goes to my feet. So every time we cruise crops, it's me and Mike and the two dogs. Love it. So we go, we go down the road, flying down the road in his four-wheeler, and we get onto a gravel road, and I'm looking at these farm fields. Corn is about two to three feet tall. I'm looking, what does he want to show me? 
Four-wheeler slows down. We enter, we drive into one of his corn fields. The corn is two to three feet tall. I'm looking at this corn, and it looks absolutely wonderful. I'm trying to figure out what the hell does he want to show me. The four-wheeler stops. I'm still looking around. I'm mystified. What do you want to show me? He remembers this soil health thing I told him about, and he's the guy who grabbed the iPad and showed me where he removed the fence line and the yield map was still showing where the old fence line was. I get out of the four-wheeler. I'm still looking around going, what does he want to show me? And he knows, he knows when I'm puzzled. He wanted to show me deer tracks. He said, I've never seen deer tracks sink this deep into my farm fields. That's all soil health. And guess what happens when the deer tracks are deep in your soil? You know what kind of root system that is created under your corn and beans? A good one. A good one. So these darn microbes, the reason why he wanted to show me this is he remembered what I told him. I said, when we achieve soil health, you're going to have a carbon level equal to your fence line you are going to be able to reduce the amount of fertilizer that you are spending because the microbes are going, the more microbes are going to solubilize more of that fertilizer, which he's doing. And I said, your, so your soil tilth improves. The drainage of your farms will improve. The oxygenation of your farms will improve. Your root systems will improve. And he remembered that comment five years prior, and when he called me on the phone and said to come to the, summoned me to the farm, he wanted to show me deer tracks. So I'm going to, uh, anyways, um, love the opportunity to come up here. Um, I apologize once again for not having a personal relationship with every one of the faces in this room, but if you farm 500 acres and you're a gambler, try 20 acres of this conversation and then call Nate and, and I'm going to come see you. I can't see every farm field that we treat, but I tend to show up and go to most of the farmers who tried our stuff for the first time. And these products are organically certified, so I listen to you when you're up at the farm line. If you want to try this and you've got to have Omri certified, perfect. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and introduce my better half. Um, when I walked in here, Mason, come over here. Um, I'm a relationship guy. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is I love people that are half my age. And normally people that are half my age don't like people my age. But I like young people. Mason's the age of my kids. So Mason Claude is the agronomist that is attached to me, and we do things together. We're a team of two. Mason has Minnesota like I have Minnesota. And when I walked in that door over there, I reached out my hand to shake hands, which I normally do with men, and Mason didn't want any part of that. He hugged me. This is the kind of relationship that we hope that you establish with Nate, because the first day I met Nate, Actually, the second time that I met Nate, and I walked out because I wanted to personally walk into the fields where he invested his money in, these, in this story. At the end of that day, I said, you know something, Nate, I'm just going to plant a seed here for you. Um, I enjoy your passion. I like your passion for life. I like your dedication to farmers. It doesn't take me a long time to understand that you're exactly the guy to guy I'm looking for because you're like me. So I said, if this stuff turns out at yield, I mean, I know it looks awful good in your field, but if it actually yields good, then I need a technology advocate for the Hutchinson area. So the exclusive source of this technology is now available to you in this area from Nate. And it's a really good thing that Nate had a positive experience because this is the reason I'm standing in this room and I'm meeting a whole bunch of people for the first time a long way from where I live. So Mason, Mason is the agronomist for this company. He's about 10 years ahead of his time. I love Mason. I told him this morning, I, and I said this to a guy that was standing and watching Mason hug me. I said, I love this guy like my kids. And I love my kids. 
But this is the future of the business. And when they hang around with somebody like me, we're going to learn something. I'm going to learn something from his college textbooks, and he's going to learn something from my passion and my experience. So Mason is now going to talk to you about the products that created the story that I just told. So Mason Claude, 